In the 14th century, the very first complete English translation of the New Testament was published. The principal translator of this work was John Wycliffe, an Oxford scholar and minister here at Lutterworth. Wycliffe wanted to publish the Bible in English, and when he died, he left behind him an enduring legacy the New Testament in English. The Council of Constance declared Wycliffe a heretic, banned his works and ordered his bones to be exhumed and burned. His ashes were cast into the nearby River Swift. The historian Thomas Fuller wrote of the spreading of Wycliffe's influence. They burned his bones to ashes and cast them into the Swift, a neighbouring brook running hard by. Thus the brook hath conveyed his ashes into Avon, Avon into Severn, Severn into the narrow seas, and they into the main ocean. And thus, the ashes of Wycliffe are an emblem of his doctrine, which now dispersed the world over. In the 16th century, a man named William Salisbury lived in North Wales. He would become one of the greatest biblical scholars Wales has ever known, and the first person to translate the New Testament into Welsh. Shrouded in mystery and often overlooked, many know little or nothing about him. Yet his scholarship and Christian legacy has changed Wales forever. Hello, my name is Simon Peter Sutherland and in this documentary I'm going to be visiting places closely associated with this man, William Salisbury. It is a journey that has taken me from Lancashire to North Wales, to Oxford and London, to ancient churches and remains scattered throughout this country, all in search of the revolutionary ideas and legacies of this most excellent and dedicated Christian man.
Our story begins here, in the 16th century, in a remote village in Conway County Borough. He was born here, Salisbury, in Lansdowne Anne, sometime around the year 1520. Like many ancient persons, Salisbury's life is surrounded by mystery. There is even dispute concerning the date of his birth. But whatever the facts, Salisbury's work was centralised around hard work and religion. In those days, the Latin Bible was the dominant book of society. The central meaning of life was focused upon the mortality of the body and the immortality of the soul. This meant that everything a person did was done with eternity in mind. His upbringing would have been centralised around a place like this, like a parish church, where religion was the absolute centre of everything in life. In his hometown of Lansanan, sermons, and church activities would have been very familiar territory to the young William Salisbury. And soon his zeal and quest for knowledge began to immerse. As a boy, his family home never had a Welsh Bible or any printed book in his native language. Handwritten literature would have been very familiar to him, but the Bible was available only in Latin. Tyndale's English New Testament had been outlawed in 1526, and there is no evidence at this point that Salisbury ever read a word of it. The traditional home of William Salisbury was a farm here in the hills surrounding the village of Lansanan. The original house is long gone, but its memory is known locally as Kaidi. Growing up around here, the young William Salisbury, or William Salisbury, lived among the ordinary working people of Wales, yeomen, farmers and the illiterate. The people of this country would eventually become his primary concern and from his earliest days he wanted to give the people of Wales the much needed increase of knowledge, literature and most of all the New Testament in their own language. Here at Lansanan, a village landmark can be found to commemorate the memory of our famous New Testament translator. Since this very church has been here since the 13th century, perhaps even Salisbury himself sat in this very church, pondering the thoughts of translating the New Testament itself into Welsh. The 16th century was an era of religious and political turmoil. News of world events and politics travelled slowly. But in the 1520s, the printing business and the world of scholarship had a swift turnaround. Roman Catholic priest and theologian Erasmus of Rotterdam had published the New Testament in Greek and translations of this text were being made in multiple languages. And now, because of the Reformation, the Bible was being made available in everyday language to common people. Mm -hmm. 
Roman Catholic tradition had been in Wales for centuries, and Welshmen occasionally took pilgrimages to Rome. These pilgrimages were also popular here in Wales. Ever since the 7th century, pilgrims had been journeying to Holywell to visit St. Winifred's Shrine. Here, Catholic pilgrims came to seek healing and physical restoration. William Salisbury had been raised a Roman Catholic, and at his childhood home, the Salisbury family grew in wealth and stature. In 1534, Henry VIII declared the Act of Supremacy, separating the English Church from Rome. In 1536, the laws of England became the laws of both England and Wales. At that time, the whole of the British Isles was undergoing reformation, and Wales followed suit. This reformation brought about a series of newly translated Bibles in English. William Salisbury is a historically mysterious character and many aspects of his life remain unknown. I have spent many hours attempting to construct an account of his activities during these early years, but the narrative is incomplete. However, we do know that by 1540 he was receiving a high education. This places him some 22 miles or so away from Lansanan, to a delightful small town less than one mile from the edge of Snowdonia. During the years of his youth, he was educated here at Lanrist. Youth, in this case, meaning a young man, and Lanrist, or Lanrist, being an excellent place for William to receive a proper education. The two were an ideal blend. Here, his zeal for Christianity, language, poetry and knowledge all flourished. During his time at Landrest, this would have been his local church. Here, his attention would have been brought face to face with the Bible. His views and ideas more apparent. This, perhaps, is reflected in the memorial dedicated to his memory. Salisbury is on the right side of history. Translation. The people of Wales must have a Bible in their own language. But the common people continued to have no such Bible. The Welsh language was being driven out through political control and was in danger of becoming extinct. The English tongue was brought to the forefront with the aim of uniting countries on the one language. But for Salisbury, the voice of the ordinary, he knew that something needed to be done and that he was the man to do it. As previously stated, Salisbury was no easy man to track down. But his life at Langroost is well documented and locals continue to affirm he lived in a stone house just outside the village where he continued his studies. The original location of his house, as inconsequential as it is, was actually in this area 
but today it's lost modern housing has taken up the space William Salisbury was a genius and he desperately wanted to publish Welsh books. He had all the passion, ability, linguistic skills, knowledge and reputation to see things lawfully done. But at that time he lacked one thing. He had no legal right to print in Wales. The printing press was taken very seriously back in the 16th century and you needed a license to print. It was taken so seriously, in fact, that a number of Roman Catholic priests were found guilty of printing Roman Catholic literature here on the Little Lawn. It was a crime. The printing press had been culturally developed in late medieval Europe. And in the 16th century, the majority of printing in England was done at Oxford, London and Cambridge. So Salisbury left Wales and headed for Oxford. On a quest to acquire knowledge, and language studies. Salisbury headed for England and pursued his education at Oxford. Oxford has for many centuries been the centre of religious learning language, Christian studies and debate. But Salisbury's choice of learning seems to walk in different directions. During his time at Oxford he studied here at Broadgates which is now Pembroke. His choice of college essentially, being Broadgates, means that he was not particularly pursuing a theological career at the time. Here he is believed to have studied mathematics and pursued a career in law, yet he also studied Hebrew, Greek and Latin. There are no records of his achievements at Broadgates Hall, which could mean that he never graduated. It is probable that Salisbury had many reasons for being in Oxford, but in the 16th century, many reformers came here to be surrounded by the atmosphere. Here, Christians and religious people could meet with persons of like mind to debate the meaning of the Bible. But I suspect William Salisbury was being guided by a greater hand. At Oxford he was probably introduced to the writings of William Tyndall and the reformers, where he switched dramatically over from the Roman Catholic Church to the Protestant faith through their expositions of the New Testament and Holy Scripture. Salisbury had an unusual range of scholarship and Oxford was obsessed with language and knowledge and Salisbury took to this like a moth to a flame. Although he had been raised a Roman Catholic, 
Salisbury did not live in an echo chamber. He was not inclined to ignore the biblical objections and arguments made against Rome by reformers such as Martin Luther and William Tyndale. At Oxford, he was probably introduced more broadly to the writings of William Tyndale, whose expositions of scripture were hard to argue against in the light of the New Testament itself. Oxford was somewhat different to Cambridge in that it was against the Reformation. However, in this case, it was the school of learning for Salisbury to learn about the Protestant faith. Tyndall wrote strongly and harshly against the doctrines and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and Popery, so much so that he himself became an exile and left for Germany where he translated the New Testament into English. Tyndall's first New Testament translation was published in 1525 and revisions followed. Each edition would improve the translation and contribute more idioms to the English language than any other translation. This book here is the 1534 Tyndall New Testament, arguably the finest translation and revision of the New Testament that he ever did. This would have been a profound influence upon him. Salisbury is known to have mastered the use of many other languages, including Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Anglo-Saxon, English, French, Spanish, Scottish and German, the language of Luther. During his time at Oxford, he would have become very familiar with this very prominent work. This is the German Bible translated by Martin Luther. Luther's translation of the New Testament was published in 1522 and his complete Bible in 1534. In those days, the linguistics of the Bible influenced the language of society more than any other book. What is clear is that Salisbury found something very real here. Language is power, and in the 16th century, the Roman Catholic Church was determined to keep control of every word of it. But the average person in Wales had very little knowledge, if any knowledge of the language, or contradictions between the plain reading of the Bible and the broad interpretations of the Roman Catholic Church. For Salisbury, the knowledge of the Bible was at an all-time low, Likewise, Wales was in danger of losing its own identity and unique language. Salisbury knew this and decided something needed to be done. He was absolutely adamant to give the Welsh-speaking people a monumental work that they could call their own. A Bible in their own language. Creating such a monumental achievement was no easy task. The church and the state maintained absolute reign over publishing. In the 1520s, Tyndale had not been granted a license to print and would be forced out of his own country by self-exile. his New Testament was smuggled into London from Germany, here, along the Thames. In 
In this area outside St. Paul's Cathedral, Tyndale's New Testament had been publicly burned. But times had changed, and England was now on the side of the Reformation. Salisbury was a man of law and order, and to legally achieve any Welsh translation of the New Testament, he knew he needed to obtain official permission from Parliament. So Salisbury headed to England's capital, London. London in the 16th century was the center of government, politics and law. At that time the city had a population of around 40,000 souls. Here, Salisbury would have found himself surrounded by business, transportation, reformation, politics and plenty of books. His dwelling place unveils his intentions. Salisbury lived near Fleet Street, an overcrowded area renowned for the printing and selling of books. The first printing press in England had been established at London, and it was there where he became involved in the art of printing, a tool which would become very prominent throughout his life and work. In London, his influence grew stronger and his quest to give information and knowledge to his own people was furthering the Welsh language, which at that time was still under threat by the dominant English tongue. The year was 1547 and would prove to be a crucial year in his story. Following the death of Henry VIII and the coronation of his own son, Edward, England gained a new king. Edward was Protestant and is said to have read 12 chapters of scripture every day and with the assistance of Thomas Cranmer, Edward's reformation was revolutionizing England. In London, Salisbury had been disturbed by the idolatry and superstitions he encountered, but he kept focus by overcoming ignorance with scripture, so he continued his work, focusing upon what mattered and what was necessary. He was absolutely convinced that all men should have the Bible in their own language, as did Wycliffe, Huss, Luther and Tyndale before him, because he knew that the New Testament itself was the very bedrock of society, and every time it would be translated it would shape and reshape the very language in which it was translated into. For many people, Salisbury's new ideas were too moral, too deep, too ready to receive information from the Reformation. For many, Salisbury's desires for a Welsh Bible was detestable. For some, the Welsh language was for the ordinary and the commoners. 
the immoral language that held no place in society. But Salisbury knew that the Welsh language was good and needed preserving and could be used to further good morals and Christianity, that the people of Wales could be revived by the reading of the Bible and not to be hearers only, but doers of the word. In a series of forerunners, Salisbury published a number of other books which gave Wales a long-deserved rise in information and knowledge. In 1547, at London, he produced a dictionary in English and Welsh. a collection of 930 Welsh proverbs. In 1550, Salisbury published a plain and brief introduction on the pronunciation of words in the English language. For a Welshman, with an English ancestry and a rich, insightful knowledge of language, Salisbury was drawing close to achieving his aim. But, like all great works, obstacles arise. In 1553, the political and religious climate of England made a radical change. In the summer of 1553, King Edward VI died. And in July that same year, Mary Tudor ascended to the throne. This queen was devout in her services to the Pope's church and sought to undermine the English Reformation and reunite the country with Rome. Mary targeted the leading and vocal Protestant reformers one by one. London became a dangerous place for reformed Christians. Salisbury fled. Lancashire reformer and preacher George Marsh had also fled London and headed to his hometown of Bolton. In 1554, a warrant was put out for his arrest and he was tried and after many months of imprisonment and food deprivation, he was burned at the stake in 1555. His execution took place here, in Chester, close to the border with Wales. Mary had as many as 300 Protestants executed for not conforming to her position. George Marsh was brought here to Chester at Barrowell Hill and executed on the 24th of April 1555. News of this event no doubt travelled to Lansanan and the surrounding areas. Salisbury's whereabouts during this era fade into historic obscurity. Welsh tradition claims he withdrew into seclusion here in his hometown of Llansanan. Locally within Wales, it is believed that Salisbury hid away during Mary Tudor's reign in his house, Kaidi.
Today, nothing significant remains of that original house. Growing up in these parts would give us an essence of the type of person that he would, he would grow to be. Here, in these mountains, you're familiar with wildlife, you're familiar with streams and surrounded by, by vast open space of creation, with little dots of people scattered here and there. You can see that he would have been quite a person who being surrounded by this place, give him time to think. Just walking around these areas, you can see that you could get yourself lost here for months and no one would find you. It shows that he was quite a clever man in the sense that he was one step ahead of his, of his enemies. That he knew this area very well and he could hide anywhere, not just in his home. There are all sorts of things lying around here, all sorts of places where you, even today in our modern world you, you can reach them by road, but in his day, what was here? It shows that he was quite a quite a clever man and he knew his position well because he knew this area because this is where he was brought up. This seclusion lasted around three to five years. Hiding away must have been a dark and terrifying time somewhat for, for Salisbury, especially knowing the hardships that Mary put people under. I mean, she wasn't even remotely uh, tolerant towards different views or at least the accurate view of scripture that the Protestants were presenting. He must have known about the sufferings that the reformers were going through, being burnt. The news must have travelled from around England up to, up to Wales. But he saw the bigger picture. He saw, well, if, if they capture me, then the New Testament will not be translated, or at least, will God raise someone else up? Will someone else be raised up to do this? Or was the commission given to him? There's some things that people know about themselves that other people don't know and it's not for them to prove that it's just for them to continue on in the work that they've been given to do Salisbury was like that and he knew he had to live in order to see it come to pass tide soon shifted. The cultural and religious swings of Roman Catholicism was again on its way out. Providence was at work. 
On November 17, 1558, Mary Tudor died. On January 15, 1559, Elizabeth would be made Queen of England, Ireland and Wales. During the Reformation, Wales was divided into five dioceses. And during this Elizabethan era, Wales also gained five reformed bishops. One of those bishops was a man named Richard Davis, whose parish was now here at St. Asaph. It is during this era that our man William Salisbury reappears. Now the persecution was over, Salisbury was more determined than ever to see the ignorance of scripture overcome and a New Testament translated into Welsh. In 1561, a council was held here at St. Asaph Cathedral, ordering that the gospel and epistle should be both read in English and Welsh. William Salisbury was an active voice in bringing this to pass. He was close friends with the Bishop of St. Asaph, and he had more support from his contemporaries than ever before. His active spirit had been liberated. And so he returned to London to reunite with fellow reformers. Now he was absolutely destined to win over Parliament and see a bill passed for the New Testament to be officially translated into Welsh. Salisbury actively worked behind the scenes and after many years of preparation and campaigning he finally received a breakthrough. In 1563 it was commanded by law and in the name of Queen Elizabeth that every parish church in Wales should have a Bible in their own language. This was to be completed by St. David's Day, 1567. The man in charge was Richard Davis, the Bishop of St. Asaph. Bishop Davies embraced William Salisbury's quest for a Welsh Bible and they agreed to collaborate. Now after many years of labour, William Salisbury was finally embracing his quest with open arms. London, however, was not so fortunate. In 1563, London was hit with an outbreak of plague. In June, there were 17 deaths per week. By August, nearly 1,000 Londoners were dying of plague each week. London was in a state of panic. Church wardens and curates instructed their churchgoers to stay at home. By the end of August, an average of 1,449 people were dying of this plague each week. This would result in over 20,000 deaths. The year was 1563, and tensions were high. The responsibility of translation also included the printing, financing, and completion. He also had the task of translating the Book of Common Prayer and Psalms. 
This journey would take him across Wales to St David's in Pembrokeshire. During the years 1565 to 1567, Salisbury is believed to have stayed at the home of Bishop Davis, with whom he was working on the translation of the Book of Common Prayer and the New Testament into Welsh. Salisbury translated the New Testament using both Greek and Latin. But he also consulted English translations, including the Geneva Bible, and also Theodore Beza's Latin New Testament. But his reason for doing this was because of his love of language. He had such a broad view of language that one of the most controversial things about his New Testament is, is that he wanted to incorporate both Northern Wales and Southern Wales in other words, he wanted to use the language of North Wales and the language of South Wales. This, of course, to some would be confusing also with his Latinization of certain words. But really, the whole idea of that stems from his love of language and also his love of having everybody in Wales having the New Testament. So even if it's people from South Wales, or North Wales, or people who read Latin. His idea and his absolute passion was for all people of his own country to have the New Testament, and then eventually to have the entire Bible. It was absolutely passionate to him. And for that, I think he's absolutely commendable. It was the heart and the passion behind the translation work that he did and the motive behind it, which is of the greatest worth. This book is a book of ancient medieval Welsh poetry. It was published here in Wales in the early 1770s. In Salisbury's time, the original manuscripts were unavailable. But however, I think he would have loved to have got his hands on these texts and published them. After all, he had such a depth of love for language and for the Welsh language, of course. So much so that his understanding was if people understood language better, even through poetry or through wisdom, then they could better understand the New Testament when they read it. But the connection between poetry and the New Testament, even the Old Testament, if we can see that through Salisbury's eyes, he would see that wisdom and Proverbs had an original root that dated back to the Old Testament. After all, what is wisdom if not the stem of the wisdom of God? What is poetry if not the very soul of language? And what is language if it's not cultivated? After all, what is language if it isn't understood? When translating any ancient text, complications arise when discerning which manuscripts are to be used. But in the 16th century, the Greek New Testament had been newly published. And by the 1550s, a variety of New Testaments were available. When he began his New Testament translation, we can assume that he had the following books around him. Firstly, he would have needed plenty of paper, ink, 
Inkwell, Quill, and the following books. This, the Latin Vulgate, the ancient translation of the church for over a thousand years. This, the 1560 Geneva New Testament in English. This, the 1556 Latin New Testament by Theodore Beza. This, the 1550 Greek New Testament by Stephanus. And this, the New Testament in English in the 1534 edition by William Tyndale. And all of this to translate the New Testament into Welsh. When Salisbury translated into Welsh using both Greek and Latin New Testaments, he employed his translation using both Northern and Southern Welsh. His reason for doing this might have been that he wanted the Welsh New Testament to be read by people from the whole of Wales. Salisbury did not agree with the many opinions on how to translate original Hebrew and Koine Greek into the language of the common tongue. For many translators, tradition of translation often overrides the original languages themselves. Likewise, for many people, sadly, the traditions of translation and readability often override accuracy. Likewise, with many pastors and preachers, the use of rhetoric and illustrations and readability often replace accuracy, making the translation more relevant to modern culture. But such was not the case with William Salisbury. Accuracy was everything to him. We often lose something when we put an overemphasis upon easy reading. For Salisbury, the Bible, the most important book in the entire world, was to be read, and not only to be read, but to be studied, and not only to be studied, but to be understood. This is why he published so many works in the Welsh language, because he wanted people to understand language so that they could understand the Word of God. Because when people understand the Word of God, they become Christians. Translation is hard work and takes time. Time is a process of existence, an irreversible reckoning. The present then is the past now. Parliament's demand for an entire translation of the Bible into Welsh by 1567 did not come to pass. And the completed version did not prove exclusive to William Salisbury, but the work of three men, including the translation of the Book of Common Prayer and Psalms. William Salisbury translated the four Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, 1, 2, 3 John, and Jude. Bishop Davis translated 1 Timothy, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter. Thomas Hewitt translated the book of Revelation, known also as the Apocalypse. The New Testament in Welsh would be published for the very first time in 1567. Today, only a small number of these original prints exist. St. Asaf Cathedral has one of the few surviving copies. And I have come here to view it. This cabinet here is an original Salisbury New Testament from 1567. It was printed in London. When this New Testament was actually printed, Salisbury himself was actually at the printers in London. This New Testament that I have here is an exact copy of that edition and this was printed in Carnarvon in 1850. This print was published here at Carnarvon by Robert Griffith, bookseller. And the New Testament preface by William Salisbury shows his depth of biblical knowledge and his respect for those God had appointed in authority. In his preface to the New Testament, which he wrote to Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England at that time, he wrote some intriguing things. I have a transcript of it here. At the beginning of it, he calls to remembrance a time when he was a witness in London to the corrupted religion at that time, where in St. Paul's churchyard, people were occupied with making alabaster images and selling beads and vain rites to the people where people worshipped dead bones and had practices of idolatry when instead of loving the living God men worshipped dead images of wood and stones bells and bones and other such uncertain relics he also prostrates himself somewhat before Her Majesty's feet and beseeches her to deliver the people of Wales out of their spiritual bondage and the corruption of this old idolatry and false superstition which had infected Wales at that time. And he states that although 
The punishment for apostasy is often plagues and destruction by God. God had mercy upon the people by sending them a most godly and noble David and a wise Solomon. By this he states, I mean Henry the Seventh and his son Henry the Eighth. He also beseeches her and calls upon her to say that that she is like Mary Magdalene in some sense. That Mary Magdalene, for bestowing a box of material ointment to anoint Christ's carnal body, be so famous throughout the world where the gospel is preached, that if she does the same type of thing by anointing Christ's spiritual body, which is the church with the scriptures, that she will likewise have fame throughout the world where the gospel is preached. He also adds that he beseeches Her Majesty that she might have his New Testament in Welsh in her own library. And he would to God that your greatest subject of Wales might also have the whole book of God's word come to pass, which is definitely a reference there to his admiration that he would have had for William Morgan's translation of the complete Bible. And his aim is, is that the people who sat in darkness might see a great light. He finishes this preface by addressing himself as Your Majesty's most humble and faithful servant, William Salisbury. The language of it is eloquent and poetic and inspirational and uplifting and respectful. People just don't talk like that anymore. When the New Testament was published in 1567, Salisbury and Davis began to work on a translation of the Old Testament. But tradition has it that they disagreed on the translation of one Hebrew word. They couldn't come to a conclusion, thus their collaboration was over. What this shows to me is how seriously ancient biblical scholars and translators took every word of scripture. If the scripture is the word of God, then every word is important. As it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out the mouth of God. If every word of scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, then every single word of scripture is important because one word takes you to another word. One line takes you to another. If you take one part out and you mistranslate it, the whole passage can be in error. Salisbury knew this and he wouldn't bow the knee to any differences. He was obviously a man of deep conviction and conscience. Although the translation was criticised by many, Salisbury's New Testament would feed the people of Wales for a period of around 21 years. Regardless of the amount of work that Salisbury put into this work, people still criticise things, even if they are unable to do the work themselves. Sometimes the best is never good enough.
I can just imagine what it must have been like for the 16th century Welsh reader to have read for the very first time that passage of John's Gospel where Jesus gives the disciples breakfast by the Sea of Galilee. What it must have been like for the Welsh people to have read that passage for the very first time in their own language. To the Roman authorities who wanted to suppress the Bible and keep it locked away in the language of ancient Rome, Salisbury's work would have been considered as an act of rebellion and revolution, directly in league with the likes of John Wycliffe and the Lollards. Salisbury continued his gift of translation and published a Welsh edition of the Book of Common Prayer and throughout the many centuries, his work became like a shining light in a dark planet. The years that follow fall into obscurity. And after many years of hard labour, turmoil and travelling, he withdrew to study botany. Salisbury is generally believed to have died around 1584. But after his death, his work took on a new edge. Because of his translation and legacy, the work of William Salisbury spread abroad, not only in Wales, but throughout England and unto America and the world. It gave the people of Wales a new beginning, revealing the Lord Jesus Christ to countless generations of men, women and children. In 1588, the complete Welsh Bible was published for the very first time. This translation was done by a man named William Morgan. Morgan was well acquainted with Will and Salisbury and held his New Testament translation in high esteem. Morgan was born here at Penmachnow in 1545. His home, Timar, still stands to this day and here visitors from around the globe bring Bible translations in their own language. This tradition has made Timar a library of Bibles from around the world. When William Salisbury first published his New Testament in 1567, William Morgan was studying at Cambridge. Being pleased with the publication of the Welsh New Testament, in the 1580s, Morgan began to translate the Old Testament and Apocrypha, and in 1588, Morgan published the entire Welsh Bible along with his revision of William Salisbury's New Testament. This complete Welsh Bible would become the standard of Wales for almost 400 years. It would be for Wales what the King James Version was for England.
Well, in Morgan's translation of the Bible may have been to Wales, but the King James Bible was for England. But just as the King James Version contains over 85% of William Tyndale's New Testament, Morgan's Bible contains a revision of William Salisbury's New Testament. This Bible here is a King James Bible. This Bible here is the Welsh Bible. Now it seems to me that there's a marked similarity between both. For example, when William Tyndale translated the New Testament and published it in 1526, this would be the first time that the New Testament would be translated into English from the original Greek. Now when Salisbury translated, Salisbury translated into Welsh and published it in 1567, when Tyndale translated and published it in English. The King James translators, when they published the King James Bible in 1611, largely used Tyndale's work. In fact, 80% or so of the New Testament of the King James Bible is the work of William Tyndale. Likewise, when Bishop Morgan published the Bible in Welsh, in 1588, the New Testament is merely a revision of Salisbury's work. This points that the King James Bible and the Welsh Bible have a marked similarity. The common between them both is perhaps that the King James Bible, at least in the New Testament, is the work of William Tyndale. Likewise, the Welsh Bible, at least in Morgan's version, is the work of William Salisbury. This Bible that I have here dates to 1768. It's a King James Bible. And this book is the 1620 revision of the Welsh Bible which is a revision of the 1588 Bible by William Morgan. The marked similarity between them both is that the King James Bible, as it's read today by many people, is not the actual 1611 King James Bible that was printed. It's actually a revision. So words were changed and prints were changed and so on. In 1769, the King James Bible underwent a major revision, which is the versions that we often see today. And likewise, the Welsh Bible went under a major revision in 1620, which is essentially the version which is often used in Wales. The similarity is um, quite distinct, quite absolute, I would say. Copies of William Morgan's Bible are scarce. But I've come here to St. Asaph to see one of the few survivors. William Morgan died here at St. Asaph, a relatively poor man, but the legacy left behind by him has endured for centuries, and he is believed to have been buried under the high altar at St. Asaph Cathedral.
I think William Salisbury was the greatest biblical scholar that Wales ever produced. William Morgan and Bishop Davis may have been pioneers on the ship that defined the Welsh language, but the captain of all of them was William Salisbury. We don't know when he died. Some say 1580, some say 1584. No one's absolutely certain. And likewise, his resting place remains a mystery. Wales owes William Salisbury an enormous debt of gratitude. William Salisbury was a good man who believed the Bible was God's word, written down by the prophets and apostles whom he had chosen. Salisbury believed it was the absolute rule of faith and practice that every man, woman and child had the right to have a Bible in their own language. William Salisbury was a good man, if any man can be called such a thing. He stood fast in the face of opposition and persecution and knew that for those who did not read Latin or Greek, translation is the singularly most important work in the world. His strength lay not in political power, in weapons or the sword, but in the skill of language and knowing the word. It was there in the beginning and it will continue until the end. People may die the world may change, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Amen.